Um, so those of you who don't already know me, my name is Jamie Asai Fitzgerald, and I am the Director of Poets and Writers California Office and our Readings and Workshops West Mini Grants Program. We fund literary events throughout the state of California, readings and workshops. Um, these grants go directly to writers. And uh, we also hold these community meetings. I'm here today with my colleague, Ricardo Hernandez. Um, in my screen, he's in the top left corner. And um, Ricardo will be helping to moderate um, today's check-in and he's providing technical support as well. So as I said, Poets and Writers have been holding these community meetings for many, many years. And for the last few years with the support of the California Arts Council, for which we are very grateful. Um, these convenings align with our mission to promote communication throughout the literary community. Uh, just last month, we held a check-in like this one for Southern California literary presenters. And it was really heartening to hear how everybody has been doing over the last year or so um, with all of the adjustments um, that have we've had to make um, because of the pandemic. Um, so that's, that's the theme of our check-in, where we are now um, over a year and a half into the pandemic. And I hope seeing some light at the end of the long tunnel that we've been in. Um, and it's a good moment to talk about what you've been, been through, what you're taking away from this period and hopefully what you're looking forward to. During your check-ins, uh, if there's time, please feel free to also share any resources that you found particularly helpful, um, resources you might need and or can offer. And the check-in topics are going to be shared in the chat, just in case you need a review uh, of all the questions I sent you. Um, they're just guiding questions, so uh, don't feel totally responsible to answer every single thing, um, but they'll be in the chat. And you can also use the chat, of course, to share links, um, upcoming event info. Uh, if you have questions, that's a good place to put um, put your questions and then we'll, if we have time at the end, we'll try to backtrack and get to some of your questions. Um, okay, so everyone has two minutes. I'm gonna do this open mic style. I'm gonna call your name when it's your turn and then I'm gonna say who's on deck to go after so that that person, it's not a total surprise to them <laughs> um, when it's their turn. And Ricardo will hold up a sign uh, when your two minutes are up. And that means if you see the sign, which I think we should be able to see it, um, it's time to wrap up your comments. Um, and if he ha absolutely has to, he'll, as gently as you can on Zoom, he'll, he'll interject <laughs> and let you know it's time to wrap up. Um, and this is just so that we have enough time for everyone to speak. Okay, did I miss anything? Okay, so I did miss one little thing. So at the end, I hope we'll also have a little bit of time uh, because I have some announcements to share with you, just some updates regarding our mini grants and upcoming events. So without further ado, uh, we have a few special guests who agree, brave souls who agreed to help us kick things off today. And I am going to call on Peter Maravellis of City Lights Foundation first. And then on deck, we'll have Nia McAllister from the Museum of the African Diaspora. 
Thank you, Jamie. And hello, everybody. It's great to be here with you all. It's a real pleasure. Um, so the City Lights Foundation was actually founded by Lawrence Ferlinghetti right around the time of our 50th anniversary, and it was intended to kind of continue his legacy into the future. Uh, as many of you know, City Lights is a bookstore and a publishing house. Uh, the publishing house produces about a dozen books a year. Um, the bookstore itself is about close to 3,000 square feet of of space. So when COVID came about, I mean, it hit us pretty hard. We have been doing virtual events since the beginning, since the spring of 20, um, averaging like maybe one to two a week. Um, you know, I guess you could call us something of a generalist shop. I'm mean, not exactly. It's more like a highly curated generalist shop. So we have a lot of literature and translation, a lot of world literature, poetry, film, music, Politics, of course, are really, really important to us. Philosophy, and of course, we're known as being the home of the Beat Generation. Um, virtual events will probably remain a permanent part of what we do. We're going to be going into a kind of a hybrid model at some point. We are extremely careful about going back to live. We did some experiments in the fall, uh, mostly off-site events. We've got a, a bit of a complicated situation because the store itself, if any of you have visited it, it's incredibly angular with very narrow hallways. And we have a room that we usually hold events in that doesn't have much ventilation. So there's a bit of a capital campaign that we'll have to engage in. So it's uh, a little complicated for us. So I think we're gonna remain in the virtual, maybe eventually doing hybrid, going to offsite events. We've been talking to partners about doing that. Uh, I think one of the things that we really learned about the, all of this stuff uh, from the beginning is just how much work the virtual is. And then when we began doing live events during the age of COVID, we realized just how much work a live event is where you have to check passports and make sure everyone is masked. So um, I don't know if we're out of the woods just yet. I mean, right now, you know, um, we're just looking at our colleagues. Um, one of the really, really useful and very helpful things to us has been meeting with some colleagues once every few months. Uh, this woman, Julie from Warwick, who's a friend of ours, uh, Stacy Lewis, who's my colleague, we bring together these booksellers from around the country where we talk about the situation. That's been really, really helpful to us. Also, we've been just kind of keeping an eye on everything from, you know, Lit Hub to Idlevice above the tree line, any, any source possible just to see what people are thinking, what they're, you know, talking about. Also, you know, I just look at my colleagues' calendars just to see, you know, what their calendars look like. But, you know, I think uh, one of the great things that came out of it was being able to connect with people from all over the world. And, uh, you know, that will probably cement a uh, virtual, you know, in our calendar for the for the future. But, uh, yeah, as far as going back to live, we're not sure just yet. <laughs> Still waiting on that one. Thank you so much, Peter. Okay, up next, we have Nia McAllister of the Museum of the African Diaspora, and on deck, Togo Eisen Martin of Black Freighter Press. Great, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Nia, and I'm the Public Programs Manager at the Museum of the African Diaspora. Um, MOAD is a contemporary art museum. We're located downtown San Francisco, and the work we do really is featuring Black artists uh, Black contemporary artists on a global scale. And so in my work in public programs, I'm really focused on a lot of our literary programs. We have an umbrella series called Moad Lit, which encompasses our monthly African book club, our open mic series. We have authors in conversation, book launches, um, the occasional workshop. And so uh, Peter was saying uh, the pandemic has really hit us hard as well. Uh, we were already closed to the public March of 2020 to switch out our exhibitions, um, and we've remained closed until October of this year. So we're only in our, I guess, third month of being open to the public. And so we've done a lot of learning in the last 20 or so months, um, and we've done a lot of virtual programs. Um, I think we've done around 318 virtual programs, which is wildly more than we were doing previously. And of that, I would say about 90 of them are literary focused. Um, so a big chunk of what we do um, does have a literary focus and it ties into our bookstore that we have at the museum as well. And so we have found great success from virtual programming for a lot of the same reasons that Peter was mentioning, especially expanding our audience. Um, we're located here on Mission and Third, and so we would have a lot of foot traffic 
Um, but the great thing that we've learned is that we have now a national audience and international audience of people zooming in from all over the world and really learning what Moad does. And so that for us has been a huge takeaway, um, finding new ways for people to engage with our content, even if they never set foot on in the museum itself. Um, I think another benefit as well that we have seen is that we actually get to have for our literary programs, a lot of our authors join us. Previously, we would fly out artists and authors for some in-person programs, but it's a lot more accessible having people join us when it's on an online platform. And so for our monthly book club, for example, a lot of times we do have our authors join our very intimate conversation, which is kind of a new spin on what we do and something that a lot of our attendees have said they really enjoyed. Um, I think looking to the future, we've done a couple outdoor in-person programs. Um, August of this year, we did a poetry program um, in the Yerba Buena Gardens, which is our neighbor. And so that was really successful and it really it did feel different in a good way, bringing people back, um, reading poetry in person. And so we have a couple more outdoor programs that we've done and a few more this month, um, a couple of which coming up um, in Golden Gate Park in the next week or two. Um, so we're still experimenting with that and seeing what people's comfort is, but I think keeping virtual for, for the long run will be something we do. Wow, it's great to hear. That's a lot of events a year. Very impressive. <laughs> okay, um, so up next we have Tago Eisen Martin of Black Freighter Press and On Deck, Meg Hamill of California Poets in the Schools. Uh, hey everybody. <laughs> I, I, I hope everybody is good. Um, I, I, I kind of feel like uh, you know maybe maybe I should have been speaking last. Um, I, I'm definitely not or we as, as as hard as we scrap have not brought anything near uh, you know haven't brought as much to the cultural landscape of the Bay Area as some other folks on this uh, on, on this on this convening. Um, we're basically, uh, we're, we're like a pandemic baby, <laughs> really. Uh, uh, this, this, this Black Friday thing that, that, uh, that myself and Allie Jones um, co-founded. Um, we, 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 we do them, we do, we've done a monthly event called The Docs uh, that, that has worked. There was talk of, uh, you know, uh, move, moving it into into the uh, into the three dimensions, um, but there is something um, that, that there's something about that 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 kind of a national even you know international uh, a potential of keeping things online. I think we're gonna we're gonna keep it there, while at the same time looking to you know looking to do other kind of events with uh, with with with. Uh, we 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 we're hooked with the San uh, San Francisco uh, was it uh, the Bayview Opera House? I just know it as the Opera House, <laughs> you know. And then uh, you know talking to the African American Arts and Culture Complex, trying to activate some some neighborhoods in San Francisco that that kind of get left out of the um, out of out of out of the digestive system. Um, but you know, I think we're we're careful over here, not pressed. Again, we don't have as much to lose. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or, or we 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 started with nothing. So 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 um, you know, I I think our other big preoccupation is actually not necessarily um, the the, the kind of like performance orientation, um, but but the, uh, the the really the political education. Uh, because we kind of see the Bay Area as actually like a thing that remains to be seen and, and very much up for grabs. So we're, you know, politicizing, stabilizing people in that sense is um, is 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 uh, is our obsession. The end. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'm frantically trying to unmute here. Um, okay, thank you so much, Tago. And um, that was uh, Black Freighter Press. 
Next up, we have Meg Hamill of California Poets in the Schools and on deck, Jason Bayani of Kearney Street Workshop. Thanks everyone. I'm Meg. I'm the executive director of California Poets in the Schools. And we've been around for a long time and we do what the name says we do. We, we offer opportunities for poets to enter into institutions, mostly schools to teach poetry to K through 12 youth. Um, but we also go into jails and juvenile jails and, and of all sorts of institutions, libraries. Um, so we're convening a statewide network of poets who are giving back to their local communities as poet teachers. And our work is in large part to offer this statewide network of about 100, 150 poets um, opportunities and resources to do their job well. So we offer a lot of online events and this honestly is a new thing for us to be able to offer these online events to our network. And it really did come about during the pandemic. So it's been a, a beautiful silver lining. Um, we used to gather just once a year at our annual symposium in person. And after a few months of getting everyone on board technologically, we've been We've been offering professional development and open mic readings and um, creative generative workshops pretty much every week since the beginning of the pandemic. So it's it's really opened up this community that we that everyone has been longing for in our network. People have people in California poets in the schools have been involved often for 20, 30, 40 years, and they're always hungry for connection. And so this opportunity has really allowed us to connect a whole lot more. And um, we've been really trying to tune in and ask people what they, what they want and what they need. Um, and so this, has, this opportunity has allowed us to be much more responsive to the network itself and what the network wants to, wants to do together, how they want to gather together. Um, moving forward, we're, planning on keeping up this string of virtual events that, that we've birthed during the pandemic um, because our work happens in schools. There's this strange thing happening where schools are back, right? And so the schools are back in full force. And so our poet teachers are being asked to come back into schools. So that element of the work is very much happening in person. Um, Poetry Out Loud is gearing up and that element is also happening in person and yet events are still very much online. So it's like the kids are back, but the adults are still holding back and aren't quite ready to get back in person. Um, but moving forward, because we're a statewide network and our folks are spread out, I see it, thanks. I see the two minutes, yeah. Um, we're gonna carry on with this virtual event thing. And really the, the, what we've noticed works really well is having series of events that build upon each other so that folks can come and see the same people each time and offer, um, there's a sense of community that's built in that way rather than just a one-off event. There's something that people can return to every single week and start to get to know folks in a new way. So that, that has been a successful element of this online programming is series that build upon each other. My kids are screaming, so I'm gonna go back to mute. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Meg. Um, okay, up next we have Jason Bayani, Kearney Street Workshop, and on deck, Amy, I'm gonna say this wrong, Kaminer of Litquake. Uh, hey everyone, it's uh, good to see a bunch of folks here uh, that I've gotten a chance to work with before and some of you maybe get a chance to work with in the future. Um, I'm the artistic director for Kearney Street Workshop. We're a multidisciplinary Asian Pacific American arts organization in San Francisco. Um, yeah, I mean, we've, um, for us, uh, when, the, when the pandemic hit, we were in the middle of, uh, we were about to launch um, uh, a three, a really, like a three event kind of mini festival that we were doing with another uh, organiz like with another Filipino organization in, in San Francisco. Um, we had to quickly pivot to Zoom for that. I mean, it was supposed to be um, 
you know, we had a reading um, that had to move to Zoom um, and we had what was supposed to be kind of, uh, also it was supposed to be kind of like a food festival as well, but that had to move to food demos online. Um, we didn't really know um, how we could do the rest of our programs. We do a festival every year called Aperture. It's a three week, three week festival with about five different show, six different showcases. Um, we had to cancel it for last year, and um, we also had to cancel another a, a fashion show we actually do um, that we had planned to uh, put on in 2020. Uh, we brought back our arts festival this year, Aperture. Um, it was a lot. We had to make a lot of changes. Usually, you know, we're very dependent on trying to draw in a big audience and like pack a room. Um, also, it's not the festival is not only just uh, a place where we are able to kind of you know give a platform to artists, but also where it's, where we a chance for us to help develop arts or you know uh, like developing arts organizers and um, you know who join our planning committee for the festival, and so it was a bit weird because you know we had to do all of our organizing meetings over Zoom when we used to have them once every three weeks in person and so how do you try to get people to kind of like connect and you know get comfortable working together so it was very kind of weird trying to make that happen i don't think we were you know i don't think the process really came together until they were actually able to be in a room together um that was closer to the date of the festival the festival itself we had to do a hybrid uh, ended up working out pretty well and i think for the future that's what we're going to continue to do is to have some audience or hopefully at some point we can have a full audience game but we'll still have um we'll still have live stream um and we have actually we work with api cultural center and they have equipment that they lent to us to be able to put on and they've been doing that with bindle studio as well so hopefully that's going to be something we can continue to do in the future Thank you so much, Jason. Up next, we have Amy of Litquake and on deck, Robert Pesich of Poetry Center San Jose. Um, hi, everyone. So Amy Kaminer, I'm actually the development director for Litquake. And um, we did continue to hold events. Well, okay, when the, when the pandemic first started, um, we actually pivoted really quickly and in April, we started um, virtual events, um, 10 days straight. That was a little crazy. We probably uh, would not do that again, um, but we continued to have kind of virtual events. Our festival the first year was all virtual and we changed it from having a 10 day festival to it being two and a half weeks. So we spread it out, out over more days. And then this past October, we actually did um, a hybrid where we had 50% of the festival was live in person, which was actually amazing. Um, I was very nervous going into it with kind of all the changes that were happening with COVID and, you know, the constantly changing landscape. Um, we did both weekends, we did outdoors um, at Yerba Buena. So it was nice to have kind of daytime outdoor festivals and then all the indoor spaces we, you know, kind of like what Peter said, we had to check vaccination cards and you know only we did not do the kind of negative COVID test it was like literally you had to be vaccinated and you had to show um that you were so we didn't allow kind of just a negative test to make it easier um I think we will continue with hybrid events I you know some of the positives that other people have mentioned just kind of having um I mean we had people you know kind of zoom in from Scotland and New Zealand and I mean so kind of that was really incredible um, along with you know other states like New York and Iowa and just around um, the authors for the festival we tended to have it be much more Bay Area based than it's been in the past um, we did have some authors like for virtual events um, certainly a lot of authors weren't traveling so that made it easier to get some people that we wouldn't normally maybe be able to get to be in the festival um yeah and then our elder project which you know is like year-round programming that we do in um retirement centers that was 
mostly virtual, but we've actually started that in, in one of our locations is, is back in person as well. Um, yeah, I, I don't think we go back to, so again, I think we'll continue with hybrid. I don't think we'll go back to a 10 day festival. I think one of the things we learned with is trying to have, I see, trying to have, you know, four to five events in one night, you know, over 10 nights is really crazy. I'm not actually sure how we did that. Um, so it was much more relaxing to have one or two events a day. And definitely for the crawl, having 100 events in one night, I don't think we will ever do that again. Um, so just again, having kind of a smaller, um, yeah, smaller focus has helped. And I, I will say for those of you who can get back to in-person, the energy of having people again gathering was infectious and very exciting. Thank you so much, Amy. Okay, up next we have Robert Pesich of Poetry Center San Jose and on deck Joyce Jenkins of Poetry Flash and Watershed. Yeah. Okay, I'm unmuted. Great, thanks. Thank you for having this program. Um, Robert Pesich, uh, president of Poetry Center San Jose and also funds development director and uh, coordinator of the Red Well Read Reading Series. And uh, to the questions, uh, the first one, uh, we have been offering events uh, throughout the period of the pandemic, uh, mostly online events, <clears throat> included uh, readings, workshops, and outreach. Uh, the most successful of the events was the San Jose Poetry Festival. Many more people in attendance uh, from the Bay Area and also half a dozen states uh, and also half a dozen countries. We had some uh, time zone issues with uh, folks coming in from the Philippines, uh, Canada, England, Mexico, Israel, India. So that was, uh, you know, silver lining there. Uh, to the second question, <clears throat> uh, are you resuming or have you already held in-person events? Uh, we have not resumed in-person events, uh, really. Uh, many of our programs are co-sponsored by venues in and uh, near downtown San Jose, all of which continue to pause uh, indoor in-person events. Uh, the third question, uh, what have we learned? Um, well, the municipal funding model for the arts, where the primary revenue stream is TOT, the transient occupancy tax, otherwise known as hotel tax, very problematic as a source for long-term community support. And uh, uh, from the city, it doesn't adjust for inflation. So that's also an issue. Uh, I'm envisioning an increase in contribution from public-private uh, partnerships and uh, will hopefully see greater pressure on corporate giving. Uh, the events of the pandemic have underscored uh, really the importance of cultivating relationships within the community uh, with other orgs and uh, individuals. Zoom and other similar services, well, we found that uh, they were often tedious to use and inadequate in delivering a consistently engaging experience. I mean, people came in and they used them and uh, yet for some folks, it was a real challenge. Uh, membership, we were finding yearns for in-person programming. There continues to be issues of access and equity as not all folks have access to computers and reliable internet service. Membership, though, has grown as a result of the opportunity of remote attendance. Some programs will continue to be presented virtually for the foreseeable future. Due to the audience, uh, we are considering workshops as a hybrid uh, event model, and readings and performance hopefully will return largely as in-person events. We've had uh, SV Creates and the City of San Jose's Office of Cultural Affairs very helpful, Poets and Writers Town Hall meetings, very helpful, California Arts Council and the Public Health Department, very helpful, and these Yeti microphones, very good. 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, I'm so glad to be here. I'm Joyce Jenkins from Poetry Flash. We've continued to hold events, um, learning Zoom. Uh, uh, I never even heard the word before this all started. Uh, we were at AWP in uh, San Antonio when this all hit. And uh, it's been an amazing ride. But um, we started putting on Poetry Flash Reading Series events in August 2020 on Zoom. Um, we have an online bookshop that's co-sponsored by Moe's Books in Berkeley on bookshop.org. Um, we leave the Zoom on for a little bit after the recording ends so that the ending isn't so abrupt and people get a chance for personal contact. We uh, started a Poetry Flash YouTube channel and all of the Poetry Flash readings have been posted on that channel and our um, readings are also posted on the Poetry Flash Facebook page, the recordings. Our, our readings were held in person at Moe's Books in Berkeley and at uh, East Bay Booksellers in Oakland. Neither venue is opened up to in-person events and, and at this point, they're not even ready to discuss it. So we plan to resume in-person events as soon as we can, but um, if they can't do it, we'll find another Berkeley venue. Uh, we presented nine Zoom readings in uh, 2020 after we learned how to do it and 20 this year. We may move to hybrid readings in 2022. Our 50th anniversary is in November 2022, and we may present a hybrid event for that occasion at a, at a Berkeley theater, uh, maybe, maybe the Aurora or you know something like that. The 25th annual Watershed Environmental Poetry Festival we presented on Zoom in January of this year. With five events over three days, we took the same tack that Liquid did with stretching it out. Um, we showed, a, a, we had an eight minute segment of music and archival photographs to celebrate the 25th anniversary online. Um, eight minutes of music and archival photographs uh, during, you know, several times during the festival. Uh, we live streamed our Strawberry Creek Walk, which is part of Watershed, uh, and Zoomed a dance performance to poetry by Sharon Coleman under the trees next to the creek. Uh, there was an hour long We Are Nature open reading moderated by Blake Moore from uh, Point Arena. And you'll find this all posted on our Poetry Flash YouTube channel. We're planning um, uh, to do it again uh, on Zoom um, in early March. Uh, the next, the first live in-person watershed will be October 1st, 2022 at Berkeley Civic Center Park. And just to say the Northern California Book Awards, you'll find all that information on poetryflash.org. Um, Tongo Eisen Martin, who's here with us, received the NCBR Groundbreaker Award and uh, Juan Felipe Herrera, the Lifetime Achievement Award. All that info is on poetryflash.org, the online uh, literary calendar and review. For all of California, send me your events, editor at poetryflash.org. Thanks. Thank you so much, Robert and Joyce. Up next, we have Sid. I'm going to mispronounce this too, Stady of Small Press Traffic, and on deck, Lizette Wanzer from Trauma, Tresses, and Truth. Hi, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm Sid Stady. You pronounced that pretty, you did pretty good there, actually. Um, uh, of small press traffic. Um, we've been around for almost 50 years also. Uh, our 50th is on, in 2024. Um, we've had a continually running reading series through that time and we've done talks and workshops and retreats and residencies and other things over those years. Um, I started as director six months before the pandemic, so that was like a really big buzzkill. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, but there was, yeah, we, um, 
Actually, pretty much right away in um, April and May of 2020, we took some funding that we had that was going to go to in-person events and distributed it to um, over 50 poets and artists in the Bay Area. We invited them to just like make a short video from wherever they were sheltering in place. And we posted it. It was all like short, three minutes or less, like quick and dirty type of thing to just get some funding out there. And it felt like a kind of it felt like a kind of special community building moment when people were feeling so fractured and separated. Um, and it now is kind of like an interesting collection of that moment. So um, that felt like a, a something that felt kind of, I don't know, meaningful in the middle of the chaos. But um, we did do online Zoom, like a monthly Zoom series over the year last year. Um, and um, yeah, like other folks have said, it's been great to get people nationally and internationally to show up to your events when otherwise they wouldn't be able to and things like that. Um, we did this year start uh, in-person events and um, we're doing live stream to our YouTube channel because um, we have we didn't want to lose all those people who have been coming to our events over the year. So um, and that's been like actually remarkably really great. Like someone else had noted it, it really like the energy in the room. There are some people who are really hungry for in person again, and they're kind of showing up. And I was surprised that our attendance was actually higher, higher numbers than we've seen in lots of years than the organization has seen in lots of years. Um, of course, it actually means that there's um, you know, our events have also like the cost of doing our events has also significantly increased since last year because we have venue rental, we don't have a space of our own. So venue rental, we're paying a tech on-site tech person to run the live stream, uh, supplies, having somebody at the front table to check Vax cards, all that stuff. So it's a lot. It feels like a lot. Um, and so, but I feel like as an organization, we're pretty committed to having a balance between, got it, thank you, uh, having a balance between, um, you know, ex having accessibility and allowing everyone to experience our events who can online, and then also um, being able to have like the depth that comes out of in-person events, the sort of community building and relationship building that it really happens most effectively like on the ground and in person. So we're trying to figure out that balance. And um, so far these hybrid things are are working for us at the moment, uh, despite some of the headaches that come, go involved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sid. Okay, up next we have Lizette Wanzer of Trauma, Trusses and Truth. And on deck, if Sharon Coleman is here yet, she said she'd be here a little bit late. Um, we have Sharon on deck. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Lizette Wanzer of Trauma, Trusses, and Truth. Um, also, I shortcut it as TTNT. Um, it's my project, Trauma, Trusses, and Truth, Untangling Our Hair Through Personal Narrative. So that's both an upcoming book, and it was also a virtual conference this past summer that I helmed and produced in August. The book uh, and the conference also. Uh, interrogates the perception, the policing, and the persecution of African American and Afro Latina women's natural hair. For the book, the essays are from 20 authors and myself, and it will also include a discussion guide that's geared for college uh, students and above. The conference, which was this past August 7th and 8th, um, virtually, had they drew 200 attendees from 10 states and three countries, including Canada, Brazil, and Kenya. It was my first time engaging in producing an event of this kind and being on the other side of the desk. I'm usually the one who's reading or presenting work at someone else's conference. So this was um, an interesting change. And I got funding to do that from the California, uh, from California Humanities. Uh, so the book is upcoming and it's really tough to say what 2022 will bring in terms of events. So, so far I do know I'll be reading excerpts at uh, two conferences. Uh, I'm presenting a panel at AWP uh, of authors from the book. And then at the Popular and American Culture Association, I'll be reading excerpts. Um, they decided at the last minute to go virtual. And AWP is going to be hybrid, but my event is an in-person event, so 
um, I'm planning to attend in person with my panelists uh, in Philadelphia. So we'll see, we'll see what happens there. So during this pandemic year, I've learned more about technology than I ever wanted to know. I was really resistant to switching to online teaching in particular. So uh, I lost some income just because I didn't teach for the first five months of the year, um, hoping that the pandemic naively would end and we could go back to in-person. But finally, um, I've made the switch. I don't like it as much as in-person, but it's fine. The upswing uh, is that I've gotten students from across the country and even across the world. So um, that's that's been kind of a silver lining. Um, and I see I'm at time, so thank you. Oh, I'll put I'll put the links to the conference and the book in the chat. Thank you so much, Lisette. Okay, up next we have Sharon Coleman, and on deck going to my second list, Alexander Matthews, if Alexander is with us. Is Sharon with us? I don't believe so, Jamie. Okay, she's not here yet. So let's let's go to Alexander and then on deck, Camille Norton. Um, hi everyone. So um, uh, I'm uh, with the Mendocino Coast Writers Conference um, and I'm actually a recent appointee. Um, I uh, started as the annual conference was being held um, in August. Um, so since the pandemic um, started um, the in 2020 and uh, the uh, one in August 2021, um, the that was held um, on um, online uh, using Zoom. We also had um, publishing um, and craft seminars um, in the winter time and the spring, also on Zoom. Um, and as many people have said, it, it has been a, a wonderful opportunity for uh, people uh, from all over the world uh, to participate. Uh, but there definitely is, especially, um, you know, uh, it's been going since, um, I think, 1989. So uh, among many of the old timers, I think there's very much a yearning uh, to, to meet once again in person. Um, and so uh, we are um, uh, hoping that uh, the August 2022 um, uh, uh, conference uh, will be uh, done in person uh, in the town of um, Mendocino. Um, and uh, yeah, so a lot of that is kind of figuring out um, sort of uh, uh, ways of eating outside. Uh, for example, we were hoping, because the, the conference um, participants get uh, fed uh, three, well, on some evenings, three, some, some days, three meals a, a day, uh, on others only two. Um, but uh, making sure that that happens outside um, and then developing protocols around um, vaccinations um, uh, and masking and so on. Um, but yeah, uh, we're, we're cautiously uh, optimistic that it will go ahead um, in person. Um, we are a bit cautious about hybrid as a as a model as appealing as it is um none of us have i think the tech um none of us on the organizing team um have the kind of uh, uh tech skills to to pull it off um so um but i think what we will probably continue to do is um uh, have some events that are held um uh outside of the conference um, in the rest of the year um, held on Zoom, um, but with the, the conference being um, in person um, uh, uh, annually. Uh, cool, thank you. Thank you so much, Alexander. And let's see, I'm looking through our list now. And up next, we have Alice Rogoff. And on deck, Bill Vartnow. I'm Alice Rogoff, and I'm a co-editor in the Haight-Ashbury Literary Journal with Cesar Love. 
and it was a little difficult uh, working on manuscripts. We had to meet on a porch six feet apart with masks, but we did uh, put out an issue with uh, featuring Heather Burbo. And we also do live readings, but this year we did it uh, featured on Zoom through Sacred Grounds, open mic, uh, and also through um, the Park Branch Library in the Haight, which we would normally go to. We did do one uh, uh, event in person that's at the Clarion in Chinatown that Clara Sue uh, runs. And uh, about half of our invited readers came to it uh, because they were a little wary about uh, who would be vaccinated, et cetera. But it was a really nice reading. And hopefully we'll have one at Bird and Beckett Bookstore, which now has readings. It was a little difficult not being able to sell at City Lights for a while. And so we're glad that that came back. And um, also, I'm trying to think of something else. I, oh, we had a vendor. We had a street vendor. And uh, he unfortunately died. He'd been ill. And I don't think we'll go back to selling on the street like that again because of health issues. So that's unfortunate. I did happen to go to several memorials for poets this year. And uh, some of them were in person. And I felt like uh, it was a little risky, but I wanted to do it. And, and they were wonderful to go to, Jack Hirschman and also Janice Mirkatani on Zoom. And um, I think that's probably about all. Or do I have another second? Thank you so much, Alice. That's, that's good. And may they rest in peace. Um, OK, up next, we have Bill Vartnow. And on deck, Sherry Anderson. Okay, I apologize for being late. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I I don't know what I did, but no I'm problem. Not, I, yeah, I'm not <laughs> visible. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm from Paloma Poetry Walk, and and we're planning to have a uh, third Sunday in September reading. We don't know what it'll look like. Uh, yet I will make that decision in the springtime. Uh, last year we had a Zoom uh, memorial for Jerry DiGiorno, who was our founder. And, uh, and that was a couple hours long and uh, we were gonna try three hours, but it just ended up two was perfect because we were all, there were, it was a, an intimate gathering and it, and it seemed we were pushing it to go further. So we just did two hours. So uh, I, other than that, I don't know anything right now. We're, uh, we're in limbo. I, I think we'll, uh, we might, do a hybrid. We probably will just do a, uh, a Zoom, and I have to learn how to do that because obviously I don't know <laughs> what's going on with Zoom. <laughs> so uh, that's all I got to say. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bill, for representing Petaluma. Love the poetry walk. Yeah. Okay, up next we have, who did I say we had? Sherry Anderson <laughs> and <laughs> on deck, who hasn't gone yet, Danny Romero. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I am involved with the Auburn Winter Storytelling Festival, which is a little different than the poetry and the readings that uh, all the other ones have been doing. Um, in the storytelling festival, our writers tell their work rather than read it. So uh, it's uh, still original work that's spoken instead of uh, 
using notes or props. Um, this will be our sixth year coming up in 2000 in January 2022 will be our sixth year. Last time we did it in person, we had 185 attendees. Last year we did it on Zoom and we had 195 attendees. So we increased uh, a little bit on Zoom. Um, what has happened though is we're losing our volunteers. We just, they just seem to have evaporated. I don't know, no one else has mentioned a problem like that, but uh, they just don't seem to show up for planning meetings any longer. Uh, one of the nice things doing it by Zoom, we have been able to get uh, international uh, speakers. Uh, last year we had a, a lady from Israel who talked about uh, being a writer in Israel and the difficulties. Uh, our our uh, event coming up in January, we have three of our uh, speakers already lined up. One is from India, one is from uh, the UK, and one is from Georgia, you know, those foreign countries. Um, and we usually have five professional speakers. Um, the two things that I, we have had very good luck with is uh, Zoom allows you to have a poll. I don't know if you, all of you who are using Zoom are aware of that, but you can set up a poll, P-O-L-L, -L, and your attendees can write on the poll and tell what they liked about what happened, what they didn't like, if they have suggestions where they're from is often very nice to know. And we also use Eventbrite for our event, which uh, uh, we really like. You connect it to your Zoom and it's free to use. Our event is free, so the Eventbrite is free, but there is a donation button on, the, uh, on it. And Eventbrite does keep track of where the people are and what their emails are. So you have a, a list later on that you can go back and use. Um, one of the bad things that has happened to us other than losing our volunteers is we do work on donations uh, and um, our checking account has all of a sudden started a $25 a month service charge fee. $25 a month is a lot when you're getting donations at $5 here and $5 there. So we're losing donations from five people a month just from the bank, which is extremely irritating <laughs> if anybody has a, has a solution to bank service charges. We'd like to hear it. So I hope I've given you some ideas to use. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry, and I hope you're planning on applying for mini grants again. Thank you. Yes. Um, okay. I said up next, we've got Danny Romero and on deck, Eliza Tudor. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, meeting. Uh, I uh, teach at Sacramento City College and I have a class at 6 p.m., so I'm going to hurry. Uh, I run the a series at Sacramento City College uh, called El Gigante, and it began in um, spring of 2020. And at the college, I had arranged to have an auditorium, and then the pandemic struck, and so I decided to put it on Zoom. And it's been on Zoom since May uh, 2020, and uh, it was a monthly series. Um, we had, I think, in 2020, we had uh, more than a dozen. Um, readings because I originally started doing it weekly, but that was hard. Uh, so then I did it monthly and uh, we probably did like 15 events in 2020. And um, in 2021, um, we've had, um, we had five or six events in the first part of the year. Uh, we had events uh, with Sacramento State University, uh, an art exhibit was online at the, at the reading. And we've had events, or when I say we, I mean me, uh, because I'm the one who runs the program. And uh, we had a, a, a reading for uh, Sin Fronteras, a small 
independent uh, poetry journal in Las Cruces, uh, Mexico, uh, which was a lot of fun. Uh, I've had I've been able to have writers from um, East Coast, Philadelphia, New Jersey, uh, reading the series. So that's been a good thing. One day when we get back on, back on campus, you know, I probably will uh, employ uh, a hybrid model. Um, I appreciate uh, the funding uh, from Poets and Writers. Uh, Friday is Marshall de la O. Uh, if, you want, if you want the Zoom address, email me at uh, Romero D at uh, scc.losrios.edu. Uh, I got to go to class. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Nice to see everyone. Daddy, thanks for being here. Glad you Thank applied. You. All right. Okay, um, up next we have Eliza Tudor of the Sierra Poetry Festival and on deck, I think it's Bobby Coleman. Thanks so much, Jamie. Um, hi there, I'm festival director at Sierra Poetry Festival now approaching its sixth year. And I'm speaking from Nisnan and Washoe lands, otherwise known as Nevada County on the western slope of the Sierra and expecting a big snowstorm tonight. We're home to two of the state's California inaugural 14 California cultural districts and we present our festival during National Poetry Month each year. Our 2020 festival was offered online just weeks into the governor's shelter in place order against all the odds and to our own great surprise. Um, we presented to an audience in the thousands um, we offered it online free of charge. Um, in terms of representation, our poets, presenters, and audiences were among the most diverse ever, coming from 13 different countries and 26 different states. Um, this, this year, 2021, we opened the festival with a conversation between eight young poets aged between uh, 18 and 25, speaking from Nepal, India, Palestine, and Syria live and moved to our keynote speaker calling in from New Mexico. Uh, in general, our poets and presenters are drawn from among our own rich literary community, but from across California and the nation. Um, each year, virtual or not, we present poets from other countries and offer extensive public dialogue, literary critique, lots of generative workshops, and all the things you expect of a multifaceted uh, poetry festival despite its youth. Uh, 2021 Sierra Poetry Festival will be offered both in person in historic downtown Nevada City, but through whatever hybrid format we can pull off. Um, personally, I can't wait to get back um, to an in-person format, but like so many others on this, on this Zoom call today, I think we all recognize the need to be sort of intelligent about not losing the momentum that we've gained and the friends that we've made by being online. Um, our future is a little unknown as we battle the inevitable funding structures of serving a rural community, which although sophisticated in itself, lacks resources generally found in larger cities. We invite literary partnerships of all kinds and we promote our partners like crazy. We love them to death. Um, for this, uh, we feel is increasingly and critically important. So, so please stay in touch, everyone. Um, you can find us at sierrapoetryfestival.org. Um, Kim, it's so delightful to see you. Kim, you've been with us in, I think it was our first year. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Eliza, and good luck with the conference. I hope you'll apply for a mini grant again as well. Thank you. Um, okay, up next, um, I think the list has shifted. So I'm going to say up next, Aaron Brannigan. And on deck, Judy Crow. Hi there, uh, I'm Erin Brannigan. I'm actually the Communications and Development Director at the Center for the Art of Translation. And we're you know, San Francisco based, um, and we're, you know, basically we focus on championing literary translation. Our program winning small press that publishes 
contemporary international writers. And we also host live and obviously now virtual uh, events with international authors and translators. And we have a poetry and translation based school curriculum um, for schools. So obviously the two public facing programs, our events and our school curriculum school were immediately um, by the pandemic and had to constantly a year and we often host uh, events or partner with other independent bookstores who are really important uh, partners for us or we partner with other cultural organizations to host events you know celebrating our books or you know events focused on other you know translated works of interest or international authors so we immediately had to cancel a 12 uh, city book tour for a really exciting book that came out in May of 2020. Uh, so that was just gone. Um, and we had to pivot immediately to hosting virtual events like all of us. And I think I can echo what many of us have said in that the one of the great benefits to hosting virtual events was that we have been able to reach a larger audience audience, an audience uh, that wasn't physically in the Bay Area that was based all over the world. Um, and we also pivoted uh, for our school program, we started offering teacher workshops um, online, which again, different experience, but it also enabled us to work with people in various locations outside the Bay Area. So, you know, it really cut down on the number of events that we're able to host. And I do think that we will continue to host virtual events, even when we get to a point of being able to be back in person. We don't have our own event space. So it's critical to us that we partner with either event venues or as I said, independent bookstores. And we've continued to do that for our virtual events. And I think one of the challenges for us is that because we are not always hosting the events, we're partnering with the bookstores, it's been difficult for us or challenging for us to share the attendee info to kind of follow up with those people and try to bring them into our community. Um, and it's also been challenged to be, we don't own the recordings so we can share the videos but we don't have a, a you know we can put them on our website but it's been harder to kind of manage those however you know i know that we're going to continue doing that i think the reality is um this the pandemic is not over uh, and so we're looking at um how once we can go back to in-person events how will we integrate say live streaming um into the event so that people who were able to access the event internationally or from around the world Another benefit is that we were often, often paying to bring authors and translators to the United States from multiple countries. We were able to have people participate um, from countries who it would probably be challenging uh, to, to, to bring them to the US, you know, because of visa issues um, and, and travel, you know, and so that was definitely a plus of, of having virtual events. So, um, like I said, one of the challenges has definitely been kind of controlling or getting access to uh, the information, um, but it's been really beneficial to widening our audience. Thank you so much for, for that very um, thorough and informative um, check-in. Okay, up next we have Judy Crow and on deck, Kim Shook. Hello, I'm Judy Crow, and I'm a member of the Nevada County Arts Council uh, Literary Committee, and also a member of the Planning Committee for Sierra Poetry Festival. And I would just like to say that um, we are looking forward to this hybrid event in the Miners Foundry, historic Nevada City next year. And our fearless leader, Eliza Tudor, uh, gave you much good information about everything we've been able to do uh, in the past five years, going on six years. And uh, I would encourage everyone to, to check out our website, sierrapoetryfestival.org. Thanks for this. Hey, folks. Um, so I'm Kim Schneck. I'm not affiliated with an organization or um, a regular, uh, like an annual event, but I organize up to eight poetry readings a month by my lonesome. Um, some of them are located uh, or, or associated with places, but really I kind of do the thing. So <clears throat> the answer 
to the first question is variable. Yes, I immediately started doing readings with one of the venues that I planned for. No, some of them haven't opened at all yet. Um, not for virtual, not for live. So the answer is all of the options for the first question. Um, um, I think the first readings were really very much like a bad seance in that we can figure out if people were trying to get a hold of us, you know, this is sort of chaotic. Um, but um, I think I've kind of got it under control. And unless I'm using this computer, I, I would turn on the camera, except I think it would overwhelm the squirrel that's running on the wheel to power it. Um, so uh, what else have we learned? I don't know. There's um, What I found out was that there are a lot of uh, poets from communities with disability that have started attending the online things where they didn't attend the live things. And so I don't think I'll ever stop organizing online things because if it's going to make things accessible to folks, I'm happy to do it. I know that one of the places that I frequently book events for has started live poetry readings. Again, that's Burton Beckett Bookstore in San Francisco. And um, I'm not organizing those or booking those anymore. I just book the online ones, but I do two of them a month. So um, I think people need a way to connect. Uh, I was happy to be able to provide a way to connect. I probably learned other things, but I'm not sure what those things are, I, you know, apart from uh, better microphone, better lighting, and uh, I don't know. Um, if I don't wear lipstick, I look like a thumb online, <laughs> that sort of thing. Otherwise, I just, you know, I think poets need to connect with one another. I have done live readings now. Um, the one, the last live reading I did, I kept trying to find the mute button for certain people. And then the other thing I was doing was looking for the, the uh, clock in the corner of the screen, which wasn't the screen. So I don't know, I, it, it, it's good to get back live, but we've got to be cautious. Anyway, thank you for holding this space. And it's good to see so many beautiful people who I miss very badly. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, okay, just a few more folks and we'll, everyone will have had a turn. Um, so ne up next, I'm going to call on Sharon Coleman from the Berkeley Poetry Festival and on deck, Rafael Jesus Gonzalez. Thank you very much for holding this. Um, the Berkeley Poetry Festival pivoted online last year for um, our yearly um, poetry festival. Um, my co-director MK Chavez had considerable experience on Zoom since she had works on it and she taught me how to use it. So pivoting onto Zoom was, was fairly easy. Um, plus, I expanded it so that with our festival, it was not only broadcast live, it was also broadcast on Facebook and archived on our Facebook page. Um, and then the readings were um, um, seen many more times than we could even imagine. I mean, we had about a thousand views of them. Um, and they were shared on other and the readers um, pages. So we were really actually happy. Um, normally the Berkeley Poetry Festival is a one day event from noon to about 4.30 or five. Um, and um, MK had the genius of reorganizing it because Zoom is taxing on people's attention span to three days and having um, our shows and so we did that and it worked extremely well. Um, we integrated more dance. We had Visceral Roots present um, poetry and dance together and they did showed some videos that they had done as well as choreographed um, some original work to their poetry and we we're very happy. Um, so um, we are um, planning our next one for um, 
um, January, about January 21st, 22nd, 23rd. Um, and um, oh, just for last year, the 2020, we celebrated particularly um, African American um, poets. And so, um, and we had many themed um, sessions um, that were responding to the, the community. Um, and we um, gave a Lifetime Achievement Award to Michael Warr. And this year we are going to be celebrating Asian American poets um, with a Lifetime Achievement Award to Jenny Lim, um, a number of wonderful poets and um, the Naga Dance um, will be also um, presenting. They've already worked with Jenny Lim um, choreographing dance to um, poetry. Um, it's been, um, we really thank poets and writers for, for giving us um, extra funding because we were very, very, very tight last year. Our funding got halved and we were really nervous whether we could even pull it off. And thank you so much for helping us to do that. So happy that you applied. Um, Okay, up next we have Rafael Jesus Gonzalez and on deck, Richard Dry. Buenas noches, friends and colleagues. It's a pleasure to join you. I must admit that this plague has been very hard on me. Not only lost many loved ones, but uh, I'm very physical. And uh, it, it, it's been difficult for me to have all of us become talking heads in this uh, almost two years. Uh, there are advantages to the Zoom thing uh, that most have already mentioned is that at the same time that it distances us physically from our communities, Virtually, it has opened much wider communities. I've been giving readings and presentations to places that would have been very difficult for me or impossible for me to get to uh, Ireland, Mexico, uh, New York, Wisconsin, you know, a myriad of places. Uh, I've been able to give workshops, hold classes, guest classes at uh, UC Merced, at uh, Columbia University, uh, uh, different places that I would not have been able to get to. So it has opened a kind of world uh, a community in a sort, you know, it, community is such a complicated word to use. Certainly they have developed online friendships through the, uh, through the readings and conferences that I've been able to attend, the panels have set on. So that is certainly a plus. Uh, certainly uh, we have to uh, really take advantage of that in this Zoom age kind of thing, because uh, frankly, we do have to make a revolution. And the arts are one of the most powerful instruments that we have for the revolution that we have to make. And the revolution that we have to make is one of the heart and of the mind. And it does give us a, a way now to form this international uh, a kind of community of, uh, of like values. And one thing that I have found with all my colleagues that I have participated with internationally is that we do share some very fundamental values. Uh, uh, we are in the midst of confronting three crises. Uh, and that is the, the pandemic that we don't know anything about really or where it will lead. Uh, climate change, 
that we know a great deal about and we know where it will lead and worldwide fascism and domestic fascism that we have to confront. Uh, this pandemic has sort of brought all those together. And uh, so that's it. Well, like, have I continued participation and readings and things and, and rabble rousing? Yes, I have via Zoom and on the internet. Now that will continue. I, uh, um, I don't foresee it not. I have been giving uh, lately some in-personal uh, readings at the Brower Center and, and other venues. And uh, so it's a hybrid kind of thing, life readings as the times allow and Zoom. And uh, so we Zoom along and I wish you all blessings, 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 and may the muses goose you often. Thank you. Thank you, Raphael. We should have ended with you with that blessing. But we have just a few more folks um, to offer check-ins. And I think just Richard Dry is up next. And on deck, Toby Velosky. Thank you. Toby and I um, will be uh, going together in a sense. Uh, Toby and I are co-founders with Martin Nash of the Las Positas College Literary Arts Festival. And uh, Toby will be putting a link to the festival in the chat right now. Thank you so much for having us. And Raphael, that was beautiful. I really love the connection to community that you emphasized um, and the heart and values that we all share and that we're all trying to support. Um, we made a quick, well, it wasn't a quick bit. We were going to have our initial literary arts um, festival and right when the pandemic opened and oh, the pandemic happened and we uh, ended up waiting a whole year and doing it um, virtually. And that was um, quite a shift for us. It was in conjunction with our college's uh, newly uh, created creative writing certificate. And um, we were very excited about it. Luckily, most of the authors were willing to continue uh, the following year and do it online. And we were really shocked. I was really shocked at how successful it was. Uh, we had a thousand tickets sold. A lot of our, um, many of our events were, were full and we had events on from memoir writing to novel writing to how to self-publish and black Boy why black voices matter and Filipino American literature. And we have uh, a lot of great, um, folks coming this year too. We are going to go ahead and do a in-person festival, but I believe we'll probably do uh, quite a bit of hybrid work as well, especially after hearing the success that some of you have had. I really appreciate your um, helping us out with this. <laughs> and um, also I want to encourage everybody who uh, would like to collaborate with us in some form or another to get in touch with us on that website. There's a, an email that you can use and um, we'd be happy to collaborate in some form. And um, to the questions, I wanna thank poets and writers for helping support us. Uh, that was one funding source, uh, as well as our college's foundation and the Livermore City um, Arts Council and a few um, grants from our college in addition to that. And what we learned, I, I think we learned that it, it can be successful online and that actually can save some expense, but we had to learn quite a bit of technology as, um, as you all did as well. And we were happy to have people who couldn't fly in be part of the festival, which is something we're, gonna, we're going to continue. Toby, did you wanna add anything? Um, I think you've covered pretty much everything, but just wanted to say thank you uh, for for holding this event. It's um, it's really useful, really helpful, um, and great to see some um, familiar faces and names, and then also to um, hear um, from some new folks um, about some of the the uh, incredible events and and ways that we've managed through this through this time. So as Richard said, I hope um, I hope. Some of you will uh, reach out to us. This is uh, seems like a, a really great group to um, to connect with, and a lot of opportunities for for uh, cross pollination here. So, thank you.
And with that, I think we have made it through the entire list. <laughs> so let's go back. I'm going to go back to my gallery so I can see all of you. And thank you uh, for sharing uh, such amazing um, work that you've all been doing. Did we um, miss I, Bobby Coleman? Did we miss Bobby? I'm so sorry, Bobby. Oh, here I am, Jamie. I'll go add ahead. something brief. It's good to see you. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm, a, I'm involved with um, festivals and presenters and organizations that have done both um, hybrid events, uh, uh, live events in person where possible, and uh, online events. Um, and the experience that I'll offer is that, uh, yes, uh, each one has its uh, pluses and minuses. But in, 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 a couple of, uh, in a couple of important cases, by shifting, by shifting the venue to a limited seating new venue, we got much better sound, had a much better experience, and it wasn't the traditional venue that we had used before. So by being expansive and by moving to a different type of venue, even one that might not have been deemed appropriate under the old circumstances, under the new circumstances was very appropriate, turned out very well. Um, and so we were able to continue activities during the pandemic by adapting. The other, the other thing I have to say is that when we're working online, some organizations haven't figured out how to handle the challenges of the sound and the cameras. Now I'm working on my phone right now because I'm at another location, but in terms of the events, one of the presenter groups that I'm uh, president of the board, before the pandemic started, we had invested in a lot of equipment because we were trying to do more outreach anyway. And so people are now coming to us because they see that with good audio equipment, you can get a really good online thing that goes way beyond the talking head problem that uh, dear Raphael uh, was uh, mentioning. So rather than try to put it out there in a way that kind of isn't as impactful as a live event, come to us or come to others who already set up the equipment studio-wise to, to make it happen. And uh, here in the Bay Area, that, that would include, you know, me and some other groups and some others, but everywhere you go, there's going to be capabilities that you didn't realize you could collaborate with and get a better out, get a better, get a better outcome, which is going to make people a lot happier and it's going to be a lot more inclusive in the long run. It's not even a matter of expense; it's a matter of calling people up and uh, and collaborating. This group can be a catalyst for that. Thank you again, Jamie. Yes, thank you. And I, I wish we had time, more time to just kind of, you know, go back and forth um, in a more open, loose way with one another. But I do want to be respectful of your time. And I know um, folks are probably getting a little um, tired. It's getting late. Um, so when um, when I send the, the feedback link, um, to give feedback about this check-in. I would really appreciate it if um, you might say something about whether or not you'd be interested in um, jumping off somewhere from here uh, and what that might what might be useful to you. Um, if maybe we can just meet again and, and just have an open uh, exchange um, of resources and offerings and um, that kind of thing. Um, so, so please um, do put that in your feedback. I'd love to hear uh, what would be useful to you. Um, and I just also wanted to quickly um, promote our mini grants again, <laughs> and just remind you uh, that they are available. We're taking applications um, and it is for uh, readings and creative writing workshops and the grants help pay the writer. 
So you can't put them towards other event costs. They actually, the money actually goes directly to the writer. Um, but we do ask that organizations apply on behalf of the writer. And it's great for the event because you can list poets and writers as a co-sponsor. Um, you can send us your publicity. Um, you know, there are poss possible ways, you know, that that could be shared. Um, it just kind of connects you to poets and writers through, through the co-sponsorship. Um, the applications are due about six weeks before the event date. And we are funding in-person events again. And we are also funding virtual events through the end of our fiscal year. So at least through June 30th, 2022. I don't think, I'm not sure if our website is updated with that just yet. So if you go there and see something else, just ignore it. What I'm saying is how it is. It's, it's extended through June 30th. We're funding virtual events. Um, we also have some really cool new tools on our website. Um, there is a applicant toolkit that you can download and it has all the information that you need to apply successfully. Um, and there's a few other items on there that you'll see if you go to pw.org slash funding and then go to our application guidelines um, section. So if you have any questions about applying, um, feel free to reach out to me or to Ricardo. We'd be happy to answer your questions. Um, and then last but not least, I want to invite you to our next event, which will be a town hall meeting featuring the inaugural Oakland Poet Laureate, Dr. Ayodile Nzinga, who will be our guest speaker. And that should be a great event. Um, she'll speak for a few uh, 10 to 15 minutes and answer questions. And then we'll have just the open sharing, kind of like this, but but a lot shorter and, and more loose and free. So, oh, I just wanna say thank you so much. Um, two great quotes uh, from our last check-in with SoCal. Someone said, um, we learned everything by doing it wrong, which I thought was funny. And then I think the takeaway from this one was from Lizette who said, I learned more about technology than I ever wanted to know. <laughs> um, so with that, I bid you all farewell and um, I will follow up by sending a um, roster of everyone who was here and a link to the feedback form. So thank you so much for your check-ins and thank you for your work in the community. <laughs>